We have the story from Real Clear Investigations. It's been covered quite a bit over the past few months. This one is investigative issues. Independent journalist receives January 6th grand jury subpoena. Steve Baker says he believes actors in the Department of Justice seek to silence him. This is back in August. Since then, you've received notice that they actually are intending to criminally charge you. And you are a journalist. You uh, uh, you work for The Blaze or you're, you're, you're a contributor? No, I, I am now a full-time investigative journalist for The Blaze. I officially shut down my bands and my operations musically, and I am so you you were hire. you were acting as a journalist on January six. Correct. You are friends with uh, many prominent journalists, notably uh, Richie McGinnis. Yes. Who was? Uh, uh, <laughs> what did he say to you that it would be insane if they went after you yeah. for working yeah. journalism on January six? Mm-hmm. But now they're coming after you. So what's happening? Right. Well, they actually made the first threat against me all the way back in November of twenty one. I did my my FBI interview in July of twenty one, so six months after January six, and then or actually no, that was when they first contacted my attorney, and then we did the interview in October of twenty one. On November seventeenth of twenty one, my uh, uh, attorney got an email from a uh, assistant U.S. attorney out of Philadelphia who said your client, that would be me, is going to be charged within the week, and that within the week that would was have been, in 2021. Would, yes, that would have been wow. that would have been Thanksgiving week of 21 that they originally threatened me with charges. We went on a media and a press offensive instantly. You know, press release started doing you know podcasts and TV and radio interviews and things of that nature, and so I, that among other things, we think they backed off. They were like. You know, this guy's too big of a pain in the butt for us to deal with. So they just moved me to the bottom of her pile, the the assistant U.S. attorney. And and so we didn't hear from them for 20 months. They went away. Now, for 20 months, though, I kept waiting for those red dots in my bedroom window every morning. It's 6 o'clock. I, I, I have a, I, people think I'm joking when I say this. Mm. I don't have to set an alarm anymore. Mm. 6 o'clock every morning, I wake up and I look for the red dots in my window. Mm. What do you mean red dots? The, like the, the, the SWAT red. Mm-hmm lasers being yeah, weapons yeah. pointed. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that's not, you know, they don't actually use red dots anymore. It's Because uh, it would be at two in the morning. That's why I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it's 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 what I it's right. it's what I expect or what I'm uh, fearful of. And, and I've had that burden in my gut for that long. And so uh, 20 months went by. And then in August, <laughs> as you can see from that, uh, the date on that article right there by Joe Hanneman, that in August, I got another call from my attorney, said, okay, and now we have a uh, grand jury subpoena for you. And now we're subpoenaing, subpoenaing your work from January 6th. So they wanted my videos, which was completely uh, unnecessary because we not only offered that to them during my FBI interview, you know, free of charge, or uh, so to speak, with, as, a co- as a cop, yes, a complimentary uh, service to the FBI. But more importantly, it was part of the cooperation. And then secondarily, we offered it to them yet again uh, to the the uh, uh, Department of Justice uh, through exchange with my my attorney. I mean, there was nothing to hide there. It, it, it didn't matter. Uh, I, I don't think I was going to I was going to cause anybody that was there on January 6th any harm because they were already on a thousand other videos right. anyway. Mm-hmm. So it, it really wasn't going to hurt anybody if I gave them my videos. So that was my thinking anyway at the time. So we get a grand jury subpoena. The problem with a grand jury subpoena is that they don't grand juries are not seated for misdemeanor charges. Only for felonies. It's like, okay, crap, what are they looking at? What are they going to try to do now? What have they been scheming and concocting mm-hmm. for 20 months while they've been silent? So we we complied. I, I gave them a flash drive. I actually, I actually confronted my FBI agent in the parking lot at his field office with my attorney standing beside me, and I grilled him for about 15 minutes about what were, what they were doing for 20 months. What, you know, what's going on? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I said, no, that's BS. You do know because you're the one that actually has to write the statement of facts based upon which the Department of Justice will then file charges against me. So it's going to be your recommendations, you know, and he wouldn't tell me. And so uh, another five months goes by. I'm actually sitting in Thomas Massey's office in D.C., the Rayburn building, and I get another text from my attorney. And it's like, you know, because when your attorney calls you, it's never good. Mm. And so I step out into the hallway. And uh, he says, okay, I guess this is the big day. This was on Thursday, December 14th. And he said, uh, they are asking you to self-surrender in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, on Tuesday. So this has been the Tuesday before Christmas week of this past year. So I, uh, I took my, my big breath. I uh, <laughs> walked outside. And then I tweeted out that it's happening. 
And within 24 hours, you know, I had four and a half million views of that tweet. And then the blaze went into high gear and there were other media appearances as well over the next 24 hours. Within 30 hours, by five o'clock, close of business on Friday, the 15th of December, my attorney gets another call from the FBI agent. And he says, okay, we're going to postpone <laughs> your self-surrender until after Christmas. Wow. All right. So now, so my other, my lead attorney, because I have six attorneys on this case now. And so my lead attorney then, he takes over. So he contacts the new assistant U.S. attorney because now they've, they've assigned me to somebody else during that 30-hour period. They took it away from uh, assistant U.S. attorney Anita Eve out of Philadelphia, and they assigned it to a guy by the name of Adam Dreyer out of D.C., so got a new guy, young gun on the case. And, and I guess that's the, that's the kill shot. You know, the guy he's, he's the, he's the specialist, right? So, um, the week between Christmas and January 1st, my lead attorney got on the phone with him and said, okay, what's, what's going on here? Okay. Well, what right now, what he says is that they're going to delay the self-surrender till sometime mid-January. And because we know Mr. Baker's travel schedule and what he's doing, because I stay on the road almost full time. And he says, uh, we'll give you seven, give him seven to 10 days notice before he needs to come in and, and present himself. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. I'll pass that along to my client. Uh, what are the charges going to be? Well, uh, I can't tell you. What, what do you mean you can't tell? Well, I could tell you, but we're not, because as soon as I tell you, Mr. Baker will tweet it out. <laughs> as is your right, though. Yeah, wow. as is my right. Now, technically, he could fall back on the fact that until an actual judge or magistrate signs the arrest warrant, there are no charges. Yeah. So, eh, you know, well, know. so it's the end of January. What's the what's the latest? That's it. Oh, uh, we haven't heard from them since. Wow. I think the shows, uh, you know, you look at the Trump E. Jean Carroll case. And there's there's no justice system. It is weaponization of it, it, it's remarkable to me. Trump gets accused by some some crackpot old woman of a story that's based off of that that it, it bears striking stri striking resemblance to Law and Order SVU. <laughs> denies it, and the denial is defamation. Yeah. Then he, he he gets he gets accused of fraud in New York. The judge issues a summary judgment without hearing any evidence and says, "Don't doesn't matter. Trump did it." Now in the trial to determine the the amount of damages and whether or not he falsified business records, all the witnesses are like, oh, no, Trump was doing business on, on the level. It's totally fine. Doesn't matter. We've already said. So what we have here, I think it's just it's proof of they will do whatever they can get away with. And with you, you're on the line. You're not some, you know, you're not Ben Shapiro. No, you don't have millions of followers, but you're not nobody. You've got, you work in media and a lot of people are paying attention to your story. If you were like so many of the other J6ers who bumbled about confused, like I'm not talking about the rioters. I'm talking about the woman I met who said she showed up an hour after the riot, doors were open, there were no barricades and she walked around confused and went home. 18 month sentence. Yeah. She does not have the platform you have as a journalist. Yeah. And so now you've put them in this position where they're like, we got to get him. But oh man, he's too loud. This past Thursday. Myself and four of my attorneys in Dallas, in Dealey Plaza, we did a press conference. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Choice yeah. Of location. Say, good location. Yeah. Chosen you by stand one of, on the little box in the middle of the street. Well, or I, we, 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 I made sure I took uh, <laughs> photos of the X in the street. But the point being is, is that we did a press conference there. And I actually addressed the point that you were making right there. And I said it, that exact thing. Unfortunately, there were so many that had come before me already. And I'm talking specifically about other independent journalists who have been jacked up by the system and they did not have the coverage of me. They didn't have four, you know, um, great attorneys standing behind them. They didn't have the power, the bullhorn of the blaze behind them at the time. And they didn't have the reach. So they they were uh, uh, completely overwhelmed by that. Most of them having to uh, use um, uh, appoint trial, you know, court appointed lawyers to defend them that were probably of a leftist bent to begin with, didn't really care about their case. I know of individuals that have been jammed into what they call um, a, uh, you know, these, these stipulated bench trials. They don't even know what, you know, the, the, the client doesn't even know what that is. What, well, what is that? And they try to explain to him that it's a lot simpler, it's easier, it's it's going to cost you a lot less money. 
well, basically you're just walking in and pleading guilty without the opportunity to present your case or present any exculpatory or diminishing, you know, something that might diminish your charges or your diminish your, um, uh, your sentencing, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. But specifically to the independent journalists that have been caught up in this thing, I've watched trials. Uh, this is a, this is a great example. Uh, a young guy, uh, Stephen Horn, also from Raleigh, North Carolina. We never knew each other before the January 6th um, thing. But what ended up happening to him is this, this he was 22 years old on January 6th, but he had had a history of doing journalism since he was 16, including acquiring, applying for and acquiring press passes for various events that he had covered. So when he goes up to cover that event, he actually tried to acquire a, a pass. He actually contacted Metropolitan PD. Um, they wouldn't issue him one. He went anyway. He had been covering riots and you know the, the twenty riots in, in Raleigh. So he installed inside of his bicycle helmet a hidden camera so he didn't look like press. He didn't wear press anywhere, and so that he could blend into the crowd. So he gets uh, he he gets arrested. He gets the four basic misdemeanor charges. He decides he's going to do a, a jury trial, right? Mm-hmm. So in the process of doing in putting all this in D.C. in D.C. Yeah, I mean, brave kid. He's yeah. he's going. And, uh, and I'll tell you exactly why he decided to do that. There's another reporter by the name of Luke Mogelson who submitted his story to the New Yorker. He captured the famous video of the QAnon shaman inside the Senate chamber. You know, mm-hmm. chanting, praying, all of that. Mm-hmm. So. Luke and um, uh, uh, another uh, journalist by the name of J.D. Rivera from Pensacola, they basically paralleled each other through the building, took the same thing. J.D. ended up getting eight months in prison. Wow. Uh, Luke, of course, didn't because when Luke submitted his story to the New Yorker, the title of his story was Among the Insurrectionists. Yep. So he had his get out of jail free card already, you know. Yep. In, he in said insurrection. Camp. Right, right. So, but back to Stephen Horn. So Stephen Horn says, well, you know, look, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go declare my innocence in front of a jury. And so they file a motion for selective prosecution in his case, his, his attorneys do. And the judge, a Trump appointed judge by the name of Kelly, he would not allow the jury to see those press badges. What? What? That's Why? correct. How do they, how? Because. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's disgusting. He might yeah. tweet it out. It's disgusting. Because, so he would not allow that jury to see these. Now, I, I went up to D.C. to cover that trial. I was there for every minute of that of Stephen Horn's trial. And so I, I finally reached a level of frustration one day. And, you know, I, 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 I ran out into the hallway to where the, the, the attorney's room was and knocked on the door. And then one of them answered the door. And I said, you have to present blah, 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 blah. And he said, we can't. What do you mean? You, what do you mean you can't? It's the truth about his life, about his career, about his desire since he was a kid to be a journalist. We can't talk about it. We're under orders. We can't bring that up. And so what they did is the U.S. attorneys denigrated that kid. They absolutely, completely um, made any insinuation that he was there for any other reason other than to participate in the riot. Uh, it was it was completely slammed and. They could not just even show that jury, but you know, these were the press badges he acquired since he was 16. How, what did he get? Uh, this was a miracle. His sentencing was the day after Ray Epps sentencing oh, no and way. that Ray Epps sentencing sent shock wow. waves yeah. through oh, the court. Oh, got chills hearing that. Poof. Yes. Wow. Because he crazy. got off so easy with the no slap on the wrist. Wow. So so Horn only got a year probation and a two thousand dollar fine. Still too but, much. Still but, too but much. Thank God. And if it had yeah. been before Epps, very oh, likely it absolutely. would have been jail time. Because Man. because and now before Epps was the guy I mentioned from Pensacola, JD Rivera. He was actually the first person from the Panhandle of Florida to be caught up in the dragnet uh, er, early January of, of uh, 21. And he was the first one arrested in that part of the country. And he was actually contracted by a television station from Mobile. He shows up at, wow. he, he shows up at January um, uh, six with his big gear, his big expensive, you know, shoulder mounted camera. Right. And he's going through there and going through. And, and he went through the same broken window that Luke Mogelson, mm-hmm. wow. New Yorker submitted his story to. They both went through the same broken window. Luke Mogelson had his iPhone. Luke Mogelson said, yes, I used my phone as a reporter's notebook. And and JD had his expensive gear. So when he gets home, 
and the and the, the the station is all excited when they're dry he's driving home on the seventh they're calling him, you you got all this you got all this footage it's incredible we can't wait to see it can't wait to get it and then when he gets home he doesn't hear from them at all mm-hmm. a few days later over 20 agents show up at his doorstep red dots on his wife his kids his family you know what jd's crime was he never chanted he never said USA, USA. He never, uh, you know, stopped the steal or, or any chant whatsoever. He wasn't wearing all the Trump paraphernalia, that sort of thing. His crime is he had been and had covered and had been active in the Hispanic or uh, Latinos for Trump movement prior to that. Wow. So he gets, uh, he goes to a bench trial. So he was smart enough not to, you know, to risk a jury. But the judge in his case convicted him. And when he was sentenced, he was given eight months in prison. He spent his first two months in solitary confinement. When he gets out of solitary and he gets into the general population of this medium security prison in Georgia, the other prisoners uh, thought he was, a, you know, he was some sort of spy or plant or, or whatever because his story is fake. It had to be fake because yeah. because misdemeanor defendants are not sent to this prison. So they're all looking at him like going, no, hey, we're the pros. This is what we do for a living. We go to prison. Mm-hmm. We commit real crimes. Misdemeanor defendants do not come to this prison. He said, no, man. This is so infuriating. Thanks for watching this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And become a member over at TimCast.com for uncensored members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.